want to acknowledge my wife who's with me again. She's kind of a win. So, uh, one is also a doctor. We're a paradox. And, uh, and get that right now. Okay, thank you. Thank you. I'm here all week. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and uh, she's actually the director of spiritual formation at NIAC. Actually, she's transitioning out of that role. Uh, she's going to be a full time professor of spiritual formation at the seminary and the college next year when we move fully to New York City. And uh, the other thing she does is she leads a, a women's discipleship program called Empower that has now graduated over 450 women and uh, they, uh, they, they live cast it, live stream it all over the world it's in multiple countries and all over the states and it's going to be now located in New York City uh, as of next year. There's actually some information out there on the, on the, uh, in the front area you can get on that. But I'm, I'm really glad to be with you because as you can see in my title, I'm, I'm a dean, that means I'm an administrator. And all, my week has been consumed with the fall schedule and getting courses lined up. And, and Susie's laughing because she's one of my adjuncts and, uh, and, and, and interviewing adjuncts and uh, just doing the stuff that I really wasn't born for. Um, now, I have to do it. You know how your job is. You have to do stuff that you're not wired for. Um, and you have to do that so you do get to do the stuff you were born for. But I got to tell you, all week long, I've been, I've been like, Lord, on Wednesday night, I get to hang out with those crazy people in New York City that are hungry for God and are just going to pull the anointing out of me. And so uh, it's, this is kind of the highlight of my week. I think tomorrow's going to be good, too, but uh, I'm, I'm excited to be here. All right. So uh, last time I was with you, we talked about a theology of power, uh, kind of developing a paradigm for the supernatural in the Western worldview uh, with the scientific naturalism we've lived with. And, and this, this month, we're going to switch gears a little bit. Because in addition to a theology of power, we also have to have a theology of pain. And let me do a little kind of theology lesson here with you. And, and then I promise we'll be incredibly practical the rest of the night. But um, uh, I believe with the coming of Jesus, the kingdom of God came. But it did not come in its fullness. Uh, it's here in part, but it's not here in its fullness. And there's some churches that have this fully realized eschatology. They believe that the kingdom is here, it's in its fullness. The problem with that is it doesn't match reality. And while we do see healing, we do see deliverance, we do see freedom, we're in a battle where we don't win every battle. And, um, and, and there's pain, and there's suffering, and there's loss. And so there's some churches that have this well-developed theology of power, and if you don't get healed, it's because you don't have enough faith. And, and, and there's problems with that. And, and there's another part of the church that has this well-developed theology of pain and suffering. Uh, they know how to hold your hand while you're dying, but they don't know how to rebuke the spirit of death. Um, is, you know, so what I would suggest is we need both. We need both a theology of power and a theology of pain. And, and if we don't have that, uh, I, I think it's necessary to kind of, uh, you know, incubate the expectation for the supernatural. For this reason, if you start to pray for the sick and all of a sudden somebody doesn't get healed, uh, if you don't have a well-developed theology of pain and suffering, you give up on your theology of power. And you say, that's it, I'm going home, I'm not going to do this anymore. But if you know how to grieve it, if you know how to process loss and disappointment, then you get back in the game. You get back in the battle. And so that's why I think it's essential that we talk about both. I mean, people say, you know, Ron, I don't get it. You, you teach on power encounter. You teach on healing. How is it that you're also known for teaching on grieving? Because the kingdom of God is here, but it's not yet here in its fullness. And so we need both a theology of pain and a theology of power. So my starting premise tonight is that we have to grieve the painful losses of the past seasons before we can effectively embrace the present and the future. Now, this is really one of the key lessons in spiritual formation as well. Uh, I think when you don't grieve well your loss, your disappointment, your past owns you. And you get robbed of your present and you get robbed of your future because you are living with regret. You are living with that disappointment. You are living with that past season of disappointment owning you. And it literally begins to rob you of your present and future. And, and grieving is something that I think we've got to unpack. A, a simple definition. What does it mean to grieve? It means to express sorrow. 
It means that you get what is on the inside out to the surface. And in fact, Jesus thought it was very important because even in the Sermon on the Mount, he said, blessed are those who mourn for they will be comforted. Now let me unpack. What he's saying is, blessed are those who get what's on the inside out to the surface. Because there is a divine comfort. Uh, let, me, let me kind of expand it. There is a healing. There is a freedom that comes in the midst of the grieving process that sets us free for our present and for our future. And so this, this concept of grieving is incredibly important. Now, when I, when I gave you that definition to express sorrow, immediately some of the guys went, are you saying I have to cry? You know, guys, probably if you ask that question, you could use a good cry. <laughs> I, and, and we men, we don't do this very well. You know, when our favorite football team loses, we don't say, I could just use a good cry right now. You know, I mean, we don't do that. Um, and, and to be honest, I've had to learn from my wife how to process disappointment. And, um, and actually, one of the key stories with this is on our 10th anniversary, um, we've now been married 35 years. Yeah, I know. I married her when she was like 10. You know what I'm saying? And, um, but, uh, but on our 10th anniversary, we were living in Northern California, and we took the weekend. We went up to Mount Shasta. Um, I hired a hot air balloon. I mean, I, I was really good this weekend. I was like perfect 10 husband, okay? Took her out to eat at a really nice place. We're in this amazing bed and breakfast. So we had this incredible time, 10th anniversary, okay? It was good, right, hon? Okay. <laughs> That's the only one I'm going to quiz you on. Um, and we're driving back to Reading on Sunday afternoon. And she says to me, honey, um, I found this tape by this marriage counselor. Do you think we could listen to it? And I'm like, you're married to the perfect husband. I did the hot air balloon ride. I did the beautiful supper, bed and breakfast. Oh, yeah, go ahead. Plug it in, honey. Um, and so she plugs in this guy. And he's talking about how men tend to be fixers. That when our wife expresses a, a disappointment or a problem, we immediately go into fix-it mode. All right, here's what we need to do. We're going to do this. We're going to do that. And, and this guy on the tape, he goes, man, your wife doesn't want you to fix her. Because if your wife comes to you with an issue with one of your kids, she doesn't want you to fix the problem. She wants you to listen to her heart because in her heart she's wondering, am I a good mom? Am I measuring up? Um, uh, does my life, life matter in regards to my children? And, and so men, and, and I kind of look over at Wanda, and she's got tears coming down her face. And I go, I don't do this very well, do I? And she kind of shook her head. And uh, this guy said, men, when your wife comes to you, you, you have to help her get what's on the inside out to the surface. So your job is not to fix. Your job is to ask the right questions at the right times and make the appropriate noises at the appropriate time. Mm, uh, mm. Okay, tell me more. And he goes, and men, don't fake it or she'll know. And I'm like, how do you not fake it? Because um, we don't know how to do this. And, and he's going on and he says, and men, if you will do that and just help her get what's on the inside out to the surface after half an hour. And I went, half an hour? That's a long time to not fix anything. Um, <laughs> and he goes, after half an hour, your wife will look at you and say, thank you, honey. I feel so much better. And you won't have fixed anything. And then he added, and men, if you'll learn to do this, you will get lucky way more often. And I looked at my wife and she shook her head yes, and I rewound. I listened to that thing three times. Um, because I knew that I had a deficiency in this area. And if we don't learn how to get what's on the inside out to the surface, we're going to have trouble. Now, let me just let you off the hook. I think there are multiple ways to grieve. I think tears can be a way we do it. I think music can be a way we do it. I think art. I think walks in the woods. Uh, one of the things I've been doing recently is running. Uh, you know, I always thought of running as grieving because um, I hated it. But, but now I'm learning that it is one of the ways that I unpack my my garbage that kind of builds up, and I have to grieve in the midst of that process. And it's one of the ways the Lord has helped me to do it. So tonight, I want to look at five questions for uh, the issue of grief. And, uh, and so the first one I want to look at is what brings about the need for grief? Because immediately, we go to the loss of a loved one. We go to the loss of a friend or a father or a mother or a sibling. Um, but it's really just the word loss in general. And it's not just death. Loss is happening to us every single day. We are experiencing loss, we are experiencing disappointment, 
And I don't think anybody puts it better than Henry Nowen. Henry Nowen says this, if there is any word that summarizes well our pain, it is the word loss. We have lost so much. Sometimes it seems as if life is just one long series of losses. When we were born, we lost the safety of the womb. When we went to school, we lost the security of our family life. When we got our first job, we lost the freedom of our youth. When we got married or ordained, we lost the joy of many options. Oh, pause there. Pause there. So uh, one of the things I love about working at, on a college campus is working with, with uh, college kids. And um, when I was teaching at the undergrad, uh, one of our young men, he was a senior, he comes walking down the hall, and I had heard that he got engaged that week. And he had dated a number of girls, and this girl that he was dating now and that was now engaged to was amazing. They were a perfect match, and it was, it was really a, a good thing. And I looked at him, and he looked really sad. And I said to him, John, what's, what's going on, man? I heard she said, yes, you should be rejoicing. He goes, I know. Um, and I realized, okay, we have a problem here. I said, come on in. So he came into, my, came into my office, and he said, I don't know what's wrong. I know she's amazing. I know she's the one. Um, but I don't know why. I just feel so sad. And I said, I know. You have not grieved the loss of all the other options. And you have not processed those, those other relationships. And because of that, they still own you. Now, some of you immediately are going, what a jerk. Now listen, <laughs> what we did for the next hour is we went through every single one of the relationships that he has had. And he talked about what was good about them, why they came to an end. And then he prayed and blessed that girl and released her in Jesus' name. And we went through each one of those and we grieved the loss of many options but when he did, he shut the door on every single one of those relationships. And so now my question is, what happens if a young man or a young woman jumps into a marriage and never grieves the loss of many options? The doors get left open and then five, six years down the road when that person shows up on Facebook, that door's never been closed. And so I think grieving is part of even a good moment in our life as we're moving from one season to the next. Now one goes on and he says, when we grew old, we lost our good looks, our old friends, or our fame. When we became weak or ill, we lost our physical independence. And when we die, we lose it all. And these losses are a part of the ordinary life. But whose life is ordinary? The losses that settle themselves deeply in our hearts and minds are the loss of intimacy through separations, the loss of safety through violence, the loss of innocence through abuse. Uh, by the way, when we do this at college and seminary, almost every single, single grief journal that we read has the loss of innocence through abuse or early sexualization. Uh, it's something that most of us have experienced in this culture. And so he goes on and he says, the loss of friends through betrayal, the loss of love through abandonment, the loss of home through war, the loss of well-being through hunger, heat, and cold, the loss of children through illness or accidents, the loss of country through political upheaval, the loss of life through earthquakes, floods, plane crashes, bombings, and diseases. Perhaps many of these dark losses are far away from most of us. Maybe they belong to the world of newspapers and television screens, but nobody can escape the agonizing losses that are part of our everyday existence, the loss of our dreams. And the bottom line is this, nobody gets out of life without loss. Not a single person here. And, and, and you have to grieve, as I said, even the end of a good season. Let me give you two examples of that. Um, one of my favorite pictures, I wish I had it here to show you, is when I stood two years ago uh, with my daughter and got ready to walk her down the aisle on her wedding day. It was, it was the happiest day of her life. It was one of the happiest days of my life. But if you see the picture, I am crying like a baby. And I'm crying. I'm so happy. I mean, I love this guy she was going to marry. I love my son-in-law. It's like getting another son. But I had to grieve the end of my relationship with my daughter as it was. So that I could let that go and fully embrace the new relationship as it was going to be with her husband. And I was no longer the one and only. I was now the father that had to step back so that I could fully embrace that next part of life. And if you don't do that, you end up sabotaging the relationship. And you sabotage your relationship with your child. Mm -hmm. Another example is when your kids go off to college. you got to grieve that. And, and if a parent doesn't grieve that, then they become what we call on a college campus a helicopter parent. <laughs> you know, they don't let their kids go. They're constantly calling. And, or, 
they'll call the dean's office. Can you tell my kid to call me? No, I'm not gonna tell your kid to call you. I can tell why he, he doesn't wanna call you, okay? <laughs> because they haven't grieved him. So when we took our daughter to Eastern University down in Philly, we set up a room, we prayed for her, we drove off that campus and I started sobbing. I mean, I was just losing it. And Wanda's like, what's wrong? And I said, we've lost our daughter. She goes, you didn't lose her. She's at college. You don't want her to stay home and work at McDonald's. You want her to go to college. I go, I know, but she's never going to live at home again. Well, that wasn't true. They all come back. Um, <laughs> but, so I had to grieve that. And then two years later, my son says, mom and dad, I want to go to college in Florida. And I'm thinking, an 18-hour drive, there's no way I'm grieving 18 hours. We're going we're gonna to ship your stuff to Florida. We'll take you to LaGuardia. You can fly to Florida. I'll grieve the hour back from LaGuardia. That's, you know. And he goes, no, no, no. I need that 18-hour drive to process the first 18 years of my life with you and Mom. No, don't Mom. Here, here's what happened, okay? We pack up the car. We leave at the butt crack of dawn. And, you know, we leave like 4 in the morning. And we start to drive. And Wanda and my son sleep for the first 12 hours of the trip. Okay? And so I'm driving through North Carolina playing country music because that's all you can get in North Carolina. But it's okay because it's music to grieve by. You know, I lost my dog, I lost my truck, you know, my wife came back home, you know. I, you know. And, uh, and so this song comes on, it's a woman singing, and she's singing, I need a man to stand beside me, not in front or behind me. And, and I am sobbing because I got three daughters that need a good husband, you know, at this time. <sighs> so I'm crying to, I need a man to stand beside me. And Wanda wakes up and she looks at me and I'm a mess. And she hears the song, I need a man to stand beside me. And she goes, you're crying to this song. I go, don't fix me. Just make the appropriate noises and help me get what's on the inside out, okay? So, friends, let me tell you something. Because I grieved those first two kids well, I was able to fully embrace my other two girls, lacrosse seasons and games, and, and be fully present for them because I had let go. And when you don't let go, when, we, when you don't grieve well, your past robs you of your present and robs you of your future. And so loss is something we all have in common. Second question, um, why is it necessary? Or maybe another way of putting this is what happens if we don't grieve? I, I, I hear you saying, Ron, we all experience loss. We all need to do it. Well, I just don't have time. Well, if you don't have time or don't make time, the first thing that begins to happen is you will deaden your heart. You will stop to hope for so much. You begin to say things like, you know what, maybe if I don't hope for so much, it won't hurt so much. And so you begin to deaden your heart. You begin to silence the longing. And I see this with seminary students who, you know, they come to seminary. They're excited about God's vision for ministry. And they have a dream to change the world. And they're going to go for it. And I see them after four or five years. And the light has gone out in their eyes. They've been to one too many governing board meetings. And they've discovered that the worst bites in the world are sheep bites, okay? They're infected almost instantly, you know? And, uh, and I look at them and I say, man, are you grieving the disappointment? Because nobody gets the life we think we're going to get. Nobody gets the ministry we thought we were going to have. But we get what God has for us. And if we grieve what we don't get, then it gives us the courage to keep going. And so the first thing that happens, if you don't grieve, you begin to deaden your heart. There's a second thing, though, and it's, I think, even worse. We start to compartmentalize our lives. And to compartmentalize means you pretend everything is okay on the surface, but then your private life becomes the place where you numb the pain that you're not grieving, that you're not processing. And that private life becomes the place of addictions, the place where we numb the pain because we haven't processed it in a healthy way. And so neither one of those are good options. Uh, Brent Curtis, in his book, The Sacred Romance, puts it this way. So instead of dealing with the arrows, and when he, when he uses the term arrows, he's talking about the lies that attach themselves to our loss and our disappointment. And, and so instead of dealing with those, we silence the longing. We deaden our heart. That seems to be the only hope. And so we lose heart. For how many losses can a heart take? And, and let me answer that. I think if we'll embrace biblical grieving, as a spiritual discipline, not just a one-time event, but a regular 
a part of our for, of our repertoire of spiritual formation, I don't think there's anything this world can throw at us that our God can't heal. But we've got to choose it. And so Curtis goes on and he says, if we deny the wounds and try to minimize them, we deny a part of our heart and we end up living with a shallow optimism that frequently becomes a demand that the world be better than it really is. So what he's talking about is Christians who refuse to deal with pain, who refuse to deal with disappointment, and we fill the air with our Christian cliches. Hey, God is good all the time. God is good. Praise him. You know, and all those things are true. I'm not belittling that. What I'm belittling is when they're only an inch deep in our life. And that's what the world spots from a mile away. They spot Christians that haven't embraced pain and suffering and grieved their losses. And, um, and the shallow optimism, I think, is one of the biggest detriments to successful evangelism. And so uh, Curtis says that in the other hand, he says, is there are people that embrace the arrows, the loss as the final word on life, and they live in despair, and that's another way to lose heart. And so uh, those are the people that allow their loss to define them fully and completely, and they never escape it. It's not denial, but it's allowing the loss to define them. Third question. Let me move on. Uh, why do we avoid the grieving process? All right, if we need to do it, um, and it's important, then why aren't we all joining in? Well, we don't like pain. <laughs> and, and here we are on a Wednesday night. You know, things are going pretty well. It's a, good, it's a good week so far. And I am suggesting that for you to experience new freedom, you may need to revisit some of the most painful moments of your life. And immediately you're going, ah, I don't have time to do that. There is no way I'm going back there. There's no way I'm going to do that because it hurts too much. It's too painful. I don't want to revisit that. But friends, what I'm suggesting is that that pain and that unresolved loss is robbing you. And your life is not full and not abundant because you're being sabotaged by that past that's unresolved. Uh, I like to think of it like this. This is kind of a lousy diagram, but it, it works for me. If, if this is a continuum in terms of what we feel, in, in terms of pain over here and joy over here, when we start to feel pain, we go, oh, that hurts. I don't want to feel it. I'm going to move the wall in. And we begin to shut down our emotions and say, I'm not going to feel. I'm not going to feel. But here's the problem. You can't shut down your emotions selectively. When you move the wall in and say, I'm going to shut down that, I'm going to pretend that didn't happen, I'm going to bury it, I'm going to get involved in work more, ministry more, I'm going to get busy. Um, what happens is the wall over here begins to move in as well. And when you start to shut down what you feel on this side, unknowingly you shut down what you feel in terms of joy on this other side. So I was out in Omaha a couple years ago, and I was actually doing a seminar on worship and celebration and uh, jubilation and this girl came up to me and, and she said uh, hey, Ron I need you to pray for a joy anointing on me I'm like, okay a joy anointing all right what's going on and she said well I, when I was a brand new Christian I had such joy and passion and I've lost my joy I've lost my passion in worship and so pray for me I need a joy download and I'm like no you don't and she said what do you mean Aren't you going to pray for me? I go, yeah, I'll pray for you. But I want you to tell me about your losses in the last year and a half. And she goes, I don't want to talk about that. I said, but I think you need to. I said, can you tell me about a relationship that ended poorly? And she immediately began to cry. And as she unpacked her story, she was a relatively new Christian, about two or three years into her walk with God. And she had been dating a non-believer who loved her deeply, and she loved him. And her Christian friend said, you got to move on. You can't date a non-Christian. There's no such thing as missionary dating. And, uh, and she broke it off. And she did the right thing. But she never grieved it. And as she began to unpack that and talk about it, she said, and every Christian guy I've dated has been a loser. Well, don't you understand? You, you can say, yeah, I've dated those guys too. Um, listen, don't be too hard on them. If you are still hanging on, then nobody's ever going to measure up. Because you're living with an idealized version of what you had, and you're not living in reality. And so I, I, she had two friends with her. And I said, these two friends were with you in this process. Did they allow you to grieve? Did they allow you to process? She said, no, I didn't think I was allowed because they did the right thing. I obeyed God. I said, I know that. But you also love this man deeply. 
and it was a great sacrifice, and it's time to grieve it. And I turned to her two friends and I said, you're gonna go over there in the corner and you're gonna let her process and you're not gonna fix her. You're not gonna pray over her, you're not gonna pat her on the back, you're gonna weep with her, and you're gonna cry, and you're gonna embrace this process. And don't give her the Christianese answers. Let her get what's on the inside out to the surface. And I watched them for three hours, and it started with her and went to the next one, went to the next one. They had a regular grief session over there. But that night, you should have seen those girls worship. You know why? Because when you tear down the wall on this side and begin to say, Jesus, I trust you enough to go to the place of my pain, he will release joy in the morning. M-O-U-R-N-I-N-G. And so that wall will come down. So, fourth question. Um, what, with what options does our past pain leave us? Now, most of you are familiar with uh, the writings of Elizabeth Kubler-Ross. Um, uh, she talked about the stages of grief, and uh, actually there's recent research that has kind of turned on end some of her study because she was only dealing with terminally ill patients, and there's some new uh, information out on grieving that's even more helpful. But she talked about stages of grief, and, and there certainly are stages of grief. Now, but I'm not talking about stages. I'm talking about what are the options people choose to live in for the rest of their life. And, um, and, and here's just a few. First is hiding or denial. This is where people become masters at pretending it didn't happen. And they use all kinds of ways to push it down and to ignore it and to deny it. Now, here's the problem with hiding or denial. It's like pushing a beach ball down under the water. You ever done that? What happens when you push a beach ball down under the water, it comes up somewhere else. Now, it, it doesn't come up where you have pushed it down, but it comes up over here, it comes up behind your back, it comes up somewhere. Now, uh, there's a new book that's just come out, it's not a Christian author, it's called The Body Doesn't Lie, and it's about how past trauma will surface in your body somewhere. That's exactly what I'm talking about. Hiding or denial will not work, it's gonna surface somewhere. And it almost never surfaces where you pushed it down. And so it's not a good solution. The second is rationalization. And rationalization can take a lot of different forms. Um, it's where you rationalize away your need to grieve because somebody else has suffered more than you. And, and so you go, oh, I've had a good life. You know, I really don't need to grieve. You know, both my parents were Christians. They didn't beat me. They didn't abuse me. There was a, but listen, your pain is still your pain. And, and no family is perfect, and there's still disappointment, and there are things that will affect you in very deep ways if you don't grieve them. Uh, see, Jesus said uh, the person that sins against the child would be better, better for a millstone to be hung around their neck. The reason is, is the wounds during childhood are exaggerated. And, and so it might not have seemed to be a big thing, but what it does is it steers the rudder of the ship just a little bit off. But by the time you're 30 or 40, you're way off course. And so you've got to go back and you've got to process that. Um, Adventures in Mission used to bring me down when they were getting ready to send out their world racers. Anybody familiar with AIM and uh, World Race? And they would bring me down because all these suburban Christian kids were like, yeah, we're going to go save the world for Jesus. We're going to go help the lepers and the orphans. And, and, uh, and, and so AIM would bring me down and they'd say, can you help us get them in touch with their own pain? Because if they don't learn to process their own loss, their own disappointment, then they go to help the poor orphans trying to fill the black hole that they've never filled themselves. And when you go do ministry that way, people know that you're getting something from them, not giving to them. And, and so we would take Adventures in Mission, all the world racers, through this process of grieving. So rationalization doesn't work. Uh, anger and bitterness. This is... Uh, where you have a level of anger that is out of proportion for what has happened. And to be honest, this is how God clued Wanda and I in that we needed to do some deep grieving and some emotional healing. Because when our kids were just little, and, and we taught them how to be healthy, we were pretty good parents, you know, we were teaching them all the right stuff. But then something would happen that would trigger anger that was just waiting to erupt. I'll, I'll never forget one time my daughter Karis was about three maybe four, not, not any older than that. And she spilled her milk and I lost it. And I'm like, Karis, what is wrong with you? You know, and I'll never forget, she looked at me and she goes, what is wrong with me? 
I'm three and I spilled my milk. <laughs> What's wrong with you, Dad? It was like a word of knowledge, you know. I'm a three-year-old. I went, I'm a mess. I need some therapy, okay? <laughs> because, <laughs> because this anger that's unresolved will come up. Um, for years, I buried and I pushed down uh, stuff that my mom did. And when Juan and I first got married, we would go home and my mom would say something that would trigger me and I would lose it. And Juan is looking at that going, okay, when she's not here, I'm the one that gets that. And so she said, honey, you're really angry at your mom. And I remember saying, you don't know what I've lived with for 23 years. She said, no, I don't. But I know that you've got to grieve it and you've got to process it because it's owning you. And it's going to rob you not just of your relationship with your mom, but your relationship with me. And so that anger, that bitterness, can be a hint that, that we need to work on this. Uh, addictions, you can name your addiction. Um, uh, you know, drugs, sex, alcohol, anything we jump into to numb the pain, it can even be ministry. It can be religion. It can be busy activity for the kingdom, but for all the wrong reasons. One time I was doing this teaching at a pastor's conference, and this pastor said to me, Man, I don't want you to come to my church because if you get all my Marthas healed, I'm not going to get anything done. And I looked at him and I said, buddy, you just admitted that you're running your church on the dysfunction of your people. And that is malpractice. And you need to get them free. And so uh, the addictions, we've got to get free. They're just masking. So uh, the reality is I think the only viable long-term uh, option is biblical grief and mourning. So now it says this. He says, yes, we must mourn our losses. We cannot talk or act them away, but we can shed tears over them. And we can allow ourselves to grieve deeply. And see, catch this next sentence. Don't miss this. He says this. To grieve is to allow our losses to tear apart our feelings of security and safety and lead us to the painful truth of our brokenness. Now, when I read that the first time, I went, why in the world would I want to tear apart my feelings of safety and security? Here's why. Your belief that you can keep yourself safe and keep yourself secure is an illusion. You're only fooling yourself, and it won't work. And so when you grieve, you are allowing God, the Holy Spirit, to tear apart the illusion that you are your own safety, that you're your own security, and it drives you to the one who can bring healing to you and become the only security and the only safety we can ever be sure of. And so now he goes on and he says, so... In the midst of all this pain, there is a strange and very surprising voice of the one who says, Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. That's the unexpected news. There's a blessing hidden in our grief. Not those who comfort are blessed, but those who mourn. Somehow in the midst of our tears, a gift is hidden. Somehow in the midst of our mourning, the first steps of the dance take place. Somehow the cries that well up from our losses belong to our songs of gratitude. Well, one last question. And... Let me give you a quick bullet list, the benefits. How, how is this going to benefit you? Okay? Uh, and I've mentioned some of these already, but let me give them to you in, in one bullet list. First of all, when you grieve, it helps us to live proactively instead of reactively. So if you've got unresolved stuff and you go into a situation that vaguely smells like that past situation, you don't live proactively, you react and you don't think through how this is different, it's not the same, you go straight to the emotion of that disappointment that you have not really dealt with. And so when you grieve, it, it allows you to live proactively and not reactively. I'll tell you where this is really important. It's really important with kids. Because what happens is you have one kid that is a certain way, and, and then the other one's nothing like that. But if a situation comes up that even smells like the previous child, then you react and you give them what they don't need. And so the reality is it helps us in every situation to have grieved that so that we live proactively instead of reactively. Second, it increases our emotional capacity to handle life and people more fully. So, you know, I'm like the rest of you. I get to a point where I say to Wanda or I say to my friends, if one more thing happens, I'm gonna blow. And, and that is a clue that I have to spend some time grieving. And, and grieving is like that safety valve at the bottom of my emotional capacity tank where I begin to empty it before the Lord and I begin to get what's on the inside out to the surface and I can literally feel 
the stress levels begin to go down and the emotional capacity begin to increase and I get margin back in my life when I grieve. That, that's why, please hear me, grieving is not just a one-time thing. Oh, I'm going to do it tonight and I'm done. No. Uh, it, loss is happening every day. And, and so I think it's going to become a regular part of our spiritual formation process. Uh, when Wanda and I teach spiritual formation, our students do a 7 to 10 page grief journal. And uh, I had a girl come up to us, this was about 10 years ago, and uh, her name was Colleen. And she said, you know, Dr. Walborn, I really don't need to do a grief journal. I'm like, yeah, yeah, I've heard it all before. You don't have any pain, you don't have any loss. Um, and uh, I'm thinking she's deluded. She was, no, 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 I've had lots of loss. But when I was 12 years old, my mom taught me to journal every night and bring my loss and my disappointment to Jesus. And so I have about 20 grief journals that I started when I was 12. And she brought them in and showed them to us. And this girl was one of the healthiest college students I'd ever met. I actually set her up on a date with my son. <laughs> so, seriously, I did. I'm like, you need to be the mother of my grandchildren. I was so stinking healthy. You know? and it didn't work, but he got a great girl. Anyhow, um, <laughs> she knows how to grieve. And, uh, but, but the reality is it was a regular part of her spiritual formation process. And so uh, it saved her an incredible amount of time in catching up. So, I'm not done yet, but the Lord's given me a word for you tonight. Some of you have tears that are long overdue. And you've been avoiding them for so long, you're not even sure how to access them. But I think that's what the Holy Spirit's doing tonight. He is stirring up some tears that are long overdue. Well, third thing. It gives you freedom and permission to risk again and set big goals. I think ungrieved losses are the number one reason we, we start to live a safe life. And we stop living in faith. We stop taking risks. And so when I grieve well, I can go for it. And listen, Juan and I are living this. I mean, this is not just ideology. Right now, we're getting ready to sell everything we have in a four-bedroom house with three bathrooms. And we are moving to New York City, man. We're like doing it. We're going for it. And, uh, and we're doing it at 56. Like, we're old, man. Uh, we feel young. But the reality is, yeah, <laughs> you look great. Uh, <laughs> keep eating what you're eating. Uh, <laughs> but the reality is, the reason we're able to take a risk like that is because we've grieved disappointment. And the truth is, we're grieving this year. And we're grieving so that we can fully embrace what God has next. Okay? And so uh, it gives you the freedom and permission to risk again. Uh, D, it keeps your heart soft and gives you empathy for others' losses. How do you walk into a hospital room where somebody has just lost a child and you've never lost a child? Well, I'll tell you what, if you're in touch with your own loss, it helps your heart to be much softer to the person that you're dealing with, even if you don't fully have the empathy of their current situation. And so I, I find that if I stay in touch with loss and disappointment, then my heart is much more sensitive and much more soft to people that are also walking through it. And in five, it restores your capacity to trust God and people again. Um, I, I saw a guy with his shirt on and he said, it, it said, the shirt said this, trust God, love people, but never trust people. And I couldn't believe somebody would be wearing a shirt like that. And I said, dude, that's some serious cynicism there. And he goes, well, you can't trust people. I go, that's true. But you don't have any other choice. Because you're either going to live a cynical life or you're going to risk again people hurting you and step out. And, um, and grieving allows you to say, God, I will trust you. But it also allows you to trust people who are not always trustworthy. And they will hurt you again. But the only other option is an isolation which will destroy you. Because we desperately need one another. And so grieving restores our capacity to trust God and people again. So in conclusion, in order to grieve your past, you've got to find ways and you've got to find people to help you get in touch with past pain. Let me tell you a story and then I'll give you an exercise and then we'll close. Um, we were up in upstate New York and I was actually preaching a sermon on lamentations, which you can't really preach lamentations without talking about grieving. And so I was hitting on some of these same principles. And at the end of the sermon, I gave, an, I gave an invitation. And from the side, this woman in her mid to late 60s came forward just sobbing. 
and her husband followed her. And they were down in the corner, I can still picture them, this was about six or seven, oh, it was a little longer than that, almost 10 years ago. I can still picture them over on the side, just weeping, and Juan and I went over to them. And we found out that this uh, woman and her husband were retired pastors. And in their first church, um, they were in their 20s, and she was pregnant, expecting their first baby. And she lost the baby. And she lost the baby quite far along in the pregnancy. And the women of the church came over, and they brought food, and they were very kind. And they came over on a Wednesday, um, and, uh, and they made sure that she was okay, and they prayed with her. But as they were leaving, this was on Wednesday, they turned to her and said, Oh, you will be in church on Sunday, won't you? Because there's no one that can play the piano like you, and there's no one to teach your Sunday school class, so you'll be there, right? And that young mom realized that she had exactly three days to grieve the loss of that baby. And so she did the best she could, and then she shut it down and went back to work. And 40 years later, we're there at that altar, and she had had panic attacks, anxiety, depression, uh, major issues with her life, disappointment. And that week we helped her process and helped her get what was on the inside out to the surface. Actually, for the first time in 40 years, she named that baby. And we had a little funeral and a memorial service. And uh, we helped her grieve it. And I'm not saying this always happens this way. I mean, there's more complex issues behind anxiety, depression. I get that. But that woman got set free. And she called me, and uh, we've stayed in touch over the years. She's now in her 70s, and uh, she's free from the anxiety attacks, free from the panic attacks, free from the depression. Occasionally, she still goes through low days, but that unlocked her. Because often, our past is what is robbing us of our present and our future. And so we've got to learn to grieve. So here's a little exercise I would give you. And, uh, we'll find a way to make this available to you. So I see people taking pictures, and I'm not sure the screen will allow it. But again, I want to remind you, this is best done as a regular spiritual discipline. Begin with a bullet list of your losses. Just say, uh, you know, I like to say this. Keep your eyes on Jesus, and then say, search me, O oh God. Is there anything that I need to process? Now, keep in mind that sometimes the Lord will bring your memory to something you think you've grieved already. But it's almost like peeling an onion. If you peel the first few layers off an onion, it'll create tears. But if you let it sit for a few days, you can put that onion right up against your eyes and you won't cry until the next layer comes off. And, and what I've discovered over the years, the Lord will often say, I want you to go deeper on that one. You went a little ways, but there's something more there and it's affecting you. And so begin with a bullet list. Uh, either start chronologically or wherever the most pain arises. Don't stop when it starts to get uncomfortable or painful. That's what we always do. Oh, that hurts too much. I'm not going to go there. I'm not going to go there. But listen, that's almost always a sign there's infection under the scalp. And you got to get to it. Because it's, it's creating a situation that affects you in many ways. And, and then find a safe place, a safe person to help you process. Listen. Do not fix. They don't need a counselor. This is not Christian counseling. This is learning to weep with those who weep and not turning into Job's comforters, okay? And I, and I think the best way to find a safe person is to learn how to be a safe person. And if we can learn how to be safe people for one another, you don't need a seminary, I shouldn't say this, you don't need a seminary degree. It would help, I think. Um, <laughs> you don't need a seminary degree to help people process loss and disappointment. Make sense? I'll tell you what, uh, let me open it up. Any questions, comments? You know, because I, I mean, this is a heavy subject, and normally it takes me a few weeks to unpack it uh, in a college or seminary setting. And so I've kind of you've been drinking out of a fire hydrant tonight. <laughs> I'll just take a couple of. If there's any questions? Yeah. 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 Again, I want to remind you that because I do this in a classroom situation, I assign a grief journal, but we all grieve differently. And so uh, my daughter does collages. She will, you know, so there's different ways you do it. 
and there's different ways you process it. There's others of you that might write music. We have a student now that is doing a grief journal, but he is also uh, doing spoken word, and he's writing songs. And, um, and there is something about bringing that to the surface that brings incredible comfort and brings incredible healing just in doing it without anything being changed, without anything being fixed. But here's the key. It then becomes a spiritual discipline where you make space for God where you have not had space. The, that grief, that unresolved loss has been filling that space. And so the best definition for spiritual disciplines is making space for God. That's what grieving does. Grieving makes space for the presence of the Holy Spirit to come into that area where you've been being ruled and preoccupied. Yeah. Yes. Uh, how do you draw up something that's deeply repressed from the past yeah. that you may not be aware of that you're grieving? Yeah. Um, all right. There's ways that some counselors can do that. I'm not a counselor. And so what I tell people to do is trust the Holy Spirit in this process. And I tell them, if the Holy Spirit reminds you, if the Holy Spirit brings it up, then let's deal with it. Um, but I really rely on the Holy Spirit in this process. And I don't deal a lot with repressed memories or try to do recovered memory stuff. Um, I let, keep your eyes on Jesus. Search me, O oh God. And let the Holy Spirit bring it to the surface. There are competent Christian counselors. If you are repressing, and I've dealt with students that have no memory prior to the age of 12, and that's something beyond this. And, and that's a case where you probably need to get a little more help. Um, and so that's, that's beyond what we're talking about here. Do you think prayer can, in a, a deep prayer, in a going to the well, Lord, listen, might bring it up? Sure, God can do anything. I've seen people get tremendous freedom through this process. The Lord uses it. But I don't want people to not get the help they need because they're thinking, oh, I'm just going to do this and this will fix everything. This is a spiritual formation process, but there may be time. Just like I believe in healing, but the reality is if you have an appendicitis and you don't get healed, please get it taken out. That's okay. I have grace for that. And I think I also have grace for counselors that can help you go deeper than this process can help you. One more question. I saw your hand. Yeah. Right. And you went into this, like, obviously the spiritual formation process. Yes. How does this work in, say, in terms of praying for a miracle for someone else or... Yeah. Like well, let me use a real-life example. Uh, one of my best friends in the whole world is the director of our doctorate ministry program, Martin Sanders. Some of you might, might know Martin. He's the, uh, uh, the leader of global, uh, global Leadership, International Evangelistic Association. And it was about five or six years ago that his wife Diana was diagnosed with advanced stage dementia that literally was was eating away at her brain. And I mean, we did everything we knew, knew to do. Uh, we brought in everybody. I mean, we, everybody. I mean, we were, uh, we, did, we took every approach. I mean, you know, and we believed for a miracle right up till the end. But I think it's possible to walk in the tension of theology of power, but also theology of pain and suffering. So while we were believing for a miracle, it is not a lack of faith to also hold your friend's hand as he's walking through the valley of the shadow of death. You can do both. And we prayed for Diana's restoration and healing right up until the day she went home to be with the Lord. And, um, and then we grieved. <laughs> and then we grieved. And, uh, and three months after Diana went home to be with the Lord, Martin and I were up at Rob Reamer's church in Boston and we were doing ministry and I look over and there's Martin and he's praying for people and they're getting healed and they're getting set free and they're getting filled with the spirit and as he's praying for them I look over and he's got tears streaming down his face and I walk over and I go are you okay buddy and he goes we didn't win that battle with Diana but I am not going to let that take me out of the fight because I'm not going to give up and I'm going to keep in the, So he grieved it well. And he's continued to grieve it well. It's painful. But this doesn't rob you of faith. It actually it enhances faith. What, what I'm saying to you is when you have a healthy uh, theology of power, theology of pain, then your disappointments and losses aren't going to take you out of the battle. 
And so that's how I hold it. Is it attention? It is attention. But that's what we're living with. The kingdom is here. We can't experience the kingdom, the power of God, but we don't win every battle. It's not a fully realized eschatology yet. And so I think we have to learn how to live with attention. Theology of power, theology of pain. Okay? I'll take one more, and then I want to pray. Sure. Yeah. yeah. Well, listen, um, I always ask the Lord when I go into a prayer time, Father, what are you doing? Because Jesus said in John 5, 19, I, I'm going to do what the Father's doing. And so if the Lord sends me in to pray for a miracle, I'm all in for the miracle. And, and, and I'm not praying in fear or unbelief. Uh, I'm, I'm all in. But if the miracle doesn't happen, then I have to know how to process and go to the next level of healing. And so I think it's possible to do both. And we've been living in this now for 30 years, and we're still seeing healing. We're still seeing victories. I feel like my faith has never been higher. But we've suffered some losses, but I'm still in the battle. And so I think it's wise to know that while the kingdom of God has come, it's not yet here in its fullness. Okay? Uh, you know, I have a friend, a dear friend, who likes to say, I refuse to develop a theology for something that shouldn't exist. And I go, I agree, it shouldn't, but it does. And if we're going to pastor people this side of heaven, wow. you've got to learn how to pick up the pieces right. and help them pick up the pieces and get back into the battle because we're not going to surrender, we're not going to retreat, we're not going to give up. And so this is triage for kingdom people to stay in the battle. Does that make sense? Stand up, let me pray for you. So Father, we thank you. We thank you for your manifest presence here tonight. And Lord, even as we do this, you are triggering some pain in people. And that word you gave me, you are releasing tears that are long overdue. And for some of you, your tear ducts have almost dried up. And, and I think what the Lord is saying is, don't be surprised if I bring some emotions to the surface that you've been unfamiliar with. And I'm restoring you. I'm restoring. It's going to feel painful at first. Please hear me. I've, I've walked through this enough. In some ways, it always gets worse before it gets better. But if you will trust him, he will walk you through the valley of, sh of the shadow of death. You will fear no evil and you will come out the other side. And so, Father, right now, I pray for courage for my friends. I pray for courage. 